To really understand the console that we're going to be working with, we need to know a couple of things. The first would be to know what type of console that we have. Then the second would be to look at the master section, what type of routing that we have there. And then we're going to take a look at the channel. And once we know one of the channels, we basically know all the channels. So that's the majority of the console. Keep in mind that there are a lot of different mixing consoles out there and a lot of different brands. So I'm going to take you through a complex type of channel strip. So the one that you have could be a little bit more simplified or it possibly has fewer functions than the channel strip that I'm going to be showing. However, the way that the channel strip is divided is almost universally the same. On the top we will find the in and output section, below that we'll find the EQ section and a dynamic section on really big consoles. Then we'll usually find the insert point, below that we find the auxiliary section and below that we've got the fader section and that uh, basically can be seen as our output section. And depending on the model we've got a routing section on the top or on the bottom of the channel strip. Like I said earlier, we can visualize the signal flow through a channel strip going from top to bottom. Normally on the top we will find the in and output module. This is where the signals enter the console and it's uh, brought up to a level at the, which we can process it. Usually we'll find a microphone and a line input there. A mic is a really low level signal so it has to be pre-amplified quite a lot. The microphone input uh, usually is an XLR type of connection, but this can also be a quarter inch jack on some cheaper models. Normally we'll find these channels inputs and outputs on the back of the console. Let's move to the top of our console. And I'm first going to be showing you this uh, solid state logic AWS console to start with. So let's just uh, use the first channel strip and uh, go to the top of it where we will find the input section. This is where the signal on the channel actually enters the console. So we can take care of the levels. On this particular console we'll find a separate gain control for the microphone as for the line input level. Then we've got a whole range of switches which influence the input signal. The plus 48 volts is the so-called phantom power, so other consoles might call this uh, phantom or phantom power or uh, in this case 48 volts. Turning on the 48 volts allows you to use uh, for example condenser type of microphones. Below that we've got the instrument switch and this allows us to uh, change the input circuitry from the microphone input to the instrument input. The pad switch allows us to uh, attenuate the input signal minus 20 dB. This uh, can also be referred to as a minus 20 dB or a minus 10 dB switch. And this can be really helpful if we're recording sounds which are uh, constantly overdriving even when our mic input signal is on the lowest. Below that we've got the phase reverse switch and this allows us to 180 degree offset or invert our input signal. The flip switch switches between the line and the microphone input on the consoles which allows us to work with the channel fader during mixing. Going down in the channel strip we'll find the high pass filter which allows us to remove that very low end of a signal. On this uh, solid state logic console we then find a four band equalizer with uh, two parametric EQs and uh, it even offers two different types of EQ circuitry. Let's take you through this middle section right here. In this small section in the center of our EQ, that's where we find our insert as well. On an insert point, the signal actually leaves the console to be processed and over a insert return slot, we will receive that signal back. This allows us to insert any type of processor onto our signal. So we could, for example, just insert a compressor onto one channel. The physical in and outputs for the insert point are normally found on the back of the console. On this particular model we find a insert send and a insert return port. On some other models you might find one port which uh, you have to connect a Y cable to for the send and the return. It doesn't mean that we're just limited to one processor when we're inserting something into a channel because uh, we can route the output of the first processor into the input of the second one and that output might go back into the insert return. Below the EQ and the insert section we'll find the auxiliary section. On this uh, particular model we actually got a separate Q send which is a dedicated headphone mix. So we don't have to use a so called effect send as they call it on this board. But normally this is uh, referred to as a aux send. An auxiliary send can be either pre or post. And this means that it can be sent either pre fader or post fader. Normally this is indicated with a pre switch. If that's not pressed it means that it's a post fader send. Auxiliary sends are used a lot to send a portion of the signal to an effects processor. For example a reverb unit. So instead of using a reverb effect as an insert we use that as a send effect. That means we can send every channel on the board to that reverb unit when uh, we have that connected to auxiliary one. 
So then the output of auxiliary 1 goes into our reverb unit, but then the output of the reverb unit needs to go back into our console. And that can either be maybe on a separate channel that we still have open, or maybe onto a group return if we have those on the console. From there on we can send the reverb onto the mix bus and we have the reverb into the mix. We've actually got four different auxiliary buses running through the console, but we can only select two per channel. We can select if we either want one or three or two or four to be the auxiliary sent for that particular channel. In a lot of next tutorials I will be running into auxiliaries and inserts quite a lot. Below that we'll usually find the fader section and it's uh, got a lot more stuff going on than just a fader. Depending on the model of the console we will now run into two groups of faders. The input fader and the tape return fader. For budget and space reasons, you will uh, usually find that the upper row of faders is not an actual fader, but it's being controlled with a knob, and this uh, obviously saves a lot of space. The flip switch, as we've seen on the top of the console, will actually allow us to flip these two channels, so then during mix down, we can actually have the lower faders controlling the tape return. In the fader section, we'll also find the pan knob. We should uh, visualize the master bus as two horizontal lines running through the mixing console, the left channel is uh, connected to the left speaker and the right channel is connected to the right speaker. So when we have signals panned into the center, it means we're sending it just as loud to the left side of the bus as to the right side of the bus. So when we pan it a little bit to the left, we decrease the level one to the right bus. So when we listen to that back over speakers, we feel that the sound is coming a little bit more from the left. In this fader section, we'll also find a mute knob, and this uh, completely takes off this channel from the mix bus, so we uh, remove it completely from the mix, so it's muted. Besides that, we'll usually find a solo knob. Depending on the console and its complexity, there's a couple of types of solo that we can run into. The solo in place, or the SIP, actually mutes all the other channels, which means it uh, actually cuts them from the stereo bus as well. So it's a destructive type of solo, which will well basically ruin our uh, stereo mix. The advantage of a solo in place is that we get a really good representation of the exact sound the way that it is in the mix. The disadvantage of a solo in place would be during a live recording or during the recording of our master. When we uh, press the solo button it means we actually remove all the other instruments from the mix while playing or whilst recording. The pre-fader listening is a type of solo which uses a separate mono bus with its own monitor level. This solo is actually taken before the fader so that means that the fader position does not affect the level of the solo. The third type of solo would be the after fader listening. It also feeds its own solo bus and therefore it is non-destructive, but this is after the fader so we can judge the level the way that it's placed in the mix. And then we've got the routing section. Here we can select to which bus that we want to send the output which is uh, after the fader. One of these would of course be the main bus or the mix bus. And this uh, allows us to send the output of this channel after the fader and the panning to the mix. On some other consoles you might find uh, group tracks here as well, so we can take the output and route that to a group. On this particular SSL console the group selection is actually on top of the console, but on many other consoles you will find this next to the fader. Like I said, uh, once we know one channel, well, we basically know all the channels, so now we know around the 80% of the board. In the third part of this tutorial I'm gonna take a look at uh, the master section on the consoles, and I'm gonna take a look at how we can route some group tracks. You can check out the third part right here.